Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. The mistletoe margarita, the Scrooge driver, the North Pole punch. The holidays call for cocktails, so get everything you'll need for them delivered with Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. So what's it gonna be? Classics like Bullet Bourbon, Don Julio Reposado, or Kettle One, or maybe something new. Find it all on Drizzly where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered for any holiday festivity. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. This year, set a self-improvement goal. Like socially dominating your friends with your superior streaming knowledge. Catch up on the hits you missed with Prime Video. From Reacher to Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour extended version. And The Hunger Games, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Watch everything included on Prime. Rent or buy new releases. Add on hundreds of streamers. One app, one password. Prime Video. Find your happy place. Restrictions apply. Prime membership not required to rent or buy. See Amazon.com slash Amazon Prime for details. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. On today's podcast, former England Test player Roland Butcher is back with me to chat about England's incredible 3-0 series win in Pakistan. Hello Roland, a happy new year to you back in Barbados. Yes, Stephen. Um, great to speak to you. And yes, Happy New Year to you as well. Um, yes, it is back. Good to be back. As you know, I was in UK for quite a long time, but it's nice to be back home. Well, you've got the fans on in the background there. Um, so it's obviously quite warm there. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's why you come here, um, to make sure that you've got good weather. Not that you didn't have good weather in the UK, which I did. Um, the, the summer was fantastic, but um, it's nice to come home. You had you had one of the hottest summers ever, where people were advised not to go on the train. Yeah, I mean it's um, it was quite incredible. Um, as you know, at times there were forty degree plus temperatures, which is unheard of for the UK and caused a lot of problems for quite a lot of people. Well, your football predictions were were better than your cricket predictions. Uh, <laughs> this is what you had to say in a couple of previous podcasts. For me, I think Brazil might be this. Brazil might be the surprise team um, in this World Cup. I, so I, I feel one of the South American teams um, could win it. And just going back, we didn't get a prediction for you from you for the Pakistan England series starting in December. I'm I'm tipping Pakistan to win. Uh, one nil, two nil, <laughs> three nil. Well, is it if, if 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 it's three if it's three test match? Um, I'm looking at a two one two one win to Pakistan. But you did say you'd be a South American team win the World Cup. Yes, um, you know, obviously for me at the time Brazil was favourite to win simply because I was thinking they were ranked um, as the number one side, and you know, predictably was the favourite. Um, Argentina very much was the dark horse. I did believe that um, a South American team would win. Really, there were only going to be, for me, there were only going to be two South American teams that could win. The chances were that it would be Brazil or it would be Argentina. And as it turned out, um, you know, Brazil flattened and then went home and um, Argentina went the full distance. Well, as for your cricket prediction, you you said 2-1. England had only won two of 24 test matches in Pakistan how did Ben Stokes and the team win 3 0? I think, first of all, let me say really congratulations to England for what has been a, a fantastic um, result. I mean, to win 3 0 in Pakistan, particularly with the aware record that England have had, not just in Pakistan, but overseas generally, which is not great. To go to Pakistan and to outplay them in every department within the game and win 3-0 at home and in the way that they won is is something special. I I must say that I never saw that coming at all. Um, As you know, 
I felt that Pakistan, by virtue of being at home, would 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 win two one. But as it turned out, you know, England were far superior in every department, uh, which surprised me really because you know I expected Pakistan to be much more competitive at home. And I've got an early question for you, um, Simon Bailey, who is Rob Bailey's brother. He's also the national chaplain for horse racing. He said. Yeah. Would you fit in in this England side, and how much would you like to play cricket in this fashion? I think I would very much fit in. Um, you know, the fact that you're allowed to, you know, play play freely regardless of situations, um, you know, is is a great thing to have, and know that you've got the backing of um, of the people in charge. I guess back in the day, um, even though the coaching captain were supposed to be in charge of of teams uh, i guess more sway was held by the board or the or the selectors in terms of of the team so captain and coach perhaps did not have the opportunity to stamp um, their philosophy on the team i think clearly what is happening with england is it's a situation where captain and coach are the captains of the ship uh, so they're able to stamp the philosophy that's the philosophy they've come up with and um, they're not getting any pushback, which is fantastic. So your question, yeah, of course I would fit in and um, I, I think I would thrive as well. Well, I'd like to explore some of the reasons why England won the three-match series. Um, topics like Ben Stokes' leadership, England out-bowling the Pakistan team, Harry Brook, the openers, and of course the 18-year-old Rian Ahmed who took seven wickets in the third test in Karachi. And I've got some more questions along the way. So starting with Ben Stokes, is he just a natural leader? Well, I mean, is there such thing as a natural leader? I don't know. I, I think the timing for Ben Stokes to take over um, was pretty important. I think things had stagnated under Jaru, even though Jaru had been performing well as a player and continued to do so. Um, it needed fresh thinking. And when Ben Stokes showed, um, when he stood in for Joe Root, um, probably a year ago, that there was something there for him to, to do, even though it was on, in a caretaker role. Um, you know, you could see that, you know, he went about things differently to Joe Root. Obviously, now, I think things have fall nicely into place um, in terms of a coach who has the same philosophy He's now got the job on a full-time basis. He's less burdened in terms of the different formats that he plays because he's just playing the two formats. He's doing less bowling, um, so he's more of a batsman captain. And, you know, he's relishing in, in, in the role. And, of course, you can't relish in a role unless your team is performing well. And that's what's happening with this England team. They're performing well. So everything's going nicely for Ben Stokes at the moment. Uh, to say whether he's a natural leader, I'm not sure whether there's such thing as a natural leader. I would say there are persons who adapt to the uh, the job and the situations better than others, uh, and clearly he's done that today. Has much sterner tests to come in the future, and the future will be perhaps in about four or five months' time. Um, you will then find out just how good a captain he is and just how good a team the England side is. But up until now, I think you know he's done everything right. Well, he's won nine of the last 10 test matches. And in the Pakistan series, as you say, he didn't do much bowling. He took one wicket and he scored 173 runs. Do you think the bowlers feel more comfortable with him as a captain? They seem to bowl better for him than they were doing for Joe Root. I think the bowlers, like the batsmen, um, are given the freedom, I think, by the management to express themselves. And that certainly, that clearly will help the players because uh, they're not playing with any fear. And, you know, when you play with fear is when you get tense, you make mistakes because you're afraid to make mistakes. If you're given the freedom to just play and whatever happens, happens, um, you get much better performances. You may get some bad ones as well, but generally, you know, players will play with confidence. And that's what's happening right now, including the bowlers. Um, you asked me the question about Pakistan. I, I think England surprised Pakistan completely. Um, I don't think Pakistan really 
expected this sort of um, approach by England. You know, very, very aggressive with the bat, looked to score quickly. Um, it didn't help Pakistan producing that first test match pitch. Um, that's possibly the worst pitch that they could have produced at home against a team like England who are going to be aggressive with their new style of play. Um, I would have thought that Pakistan missed the boat there, really, because in actual fact, what they should have produced at that first test match is a pitch that turns um, appreciably. Use your advantage, um, your home advantage, particularly when you're missing, you know, Shane Shafridi. The last thing you can produce is a, is a flat, flat pitch because you just don't have that extra pace um, to make up for, for the flat pitch. And England capitalised on that. That pitch was perfect for England in the first match because they could really then enforce the way that they played, and they did. Uh, Pakistan were always on the back foot after that, couldn't, couldn't recover. But, you know, I think many, many reasons were there for that defeat. But I think uh, Pakistan contributed significantly um, to their demise, as well as England played. Uh, I think England caught them by surprise definitely from the start of the series. And once they got their noses in front, um, there was no letting up. Yeah, first test. I mean, the first day's play with 14 runs off the, the first over, England scored 506 for four off 75 overs. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But uh, as I said, you know, the surface allowed that, you know, to happen. One of those players that got a century in the first test at Raul Pindi, where England had four, in fact, in that first test, was Harry Brook, who scored 468 runs in the series, averaging 93 at a strike rate of 93. Is he England's first world-class batsman since Joe Root? Still very, very early to say. Um, based on one very good series, um, you know, you cannot say that he's going to be a world-class player like Joe Root. Joe Root has done that over many, many years. So what has happened with Joe Root is no fluke. Joe Root has been very, very consistent, even at times when England have been struggling. So, you know, he's still got a lot to do. What I would say is that he's made the perfect start. Um, all it, be it in very good conditions and things going in your favour. He's going to have a much more sterner test during the summer in the Ashes because you're now going to be up against perhaps the best bowling attack, balanced bowling attack in the world right now in terms of fast bowlers and spin bowlers. You've got fast bowlers who are at the top of their game, um, has been at the top of their game for a long time, gets tremendous success, um, not just have pace, but have you know, ball good lines and lengths. Um, and Nathan Lyon is the best off spinner in, in the world right now. So if he can perform the way he did in, in Pakistan against the Australians this summer, then you can say that You've got um, a very good player in the making, but you know he's done well this some um, this winter in, in Pakistan. But I don't think you want to get too far ahead of yourself just right just now. Just wait and see um, how the summer pans out because um, it's not going to be easy. Is he the number five for the for the Ashes? Well, I mean, where are you going to put Johnny Bester? Um, you cannot forget what he did the last year as a batsman. Um, you know, he, he was in tremendous form until he had his accident. But can you bypass a player of that stature if he proves his fitness? Or, I mean, how do you deal with that? It's a nice position to be in uh, where you've got, you know, the luxury of choosing someone who had such a stellar year uh, and also a young man who's just come in and, you know, set a different standard. So it's a nice position to be in. What about the England openers? Ben Duckett, who hadn't played a test match for six years, scored 357 runs. Zach Crawley, 235 runs. Have England found the the two openers? Still very early. I, I will not use the Pakistan series as a yardstick because the pitches were um, quite friendly for batting, really. Um, and the Pakistan bowling was perhaps not as lethal as they would like it to be. So, 
you know, credit that they have done well, but I think this must turn a test ahead, um, just like, as I said, for the middle order. Um, you know, they're really the only true and tested player in, in that middle order right now is your root. Uh, don't let's forget that that is the case. Your root has done it for 10 years plus. So, you know, we know that, you know, even though he may have a lean time at some stage, that, you know, he will come through. But, you know, the others are still untested. They've done well in circumstances, but the big test is yet to come. And all will be revealed, uh, I guess, by the end of the summer. But bowling-wise, England seemed to out-bowl Pakistan, which no one expected. Yes, they did. And, um, you know, that, that has to be a feather in their cap to actually out-bowl Pakistan um, in Pakistan. Um, as I said, it was surprising, uh, even though Pakistan had lost, well, really, three of their main bowlers, really, because you've got Afridi, you've got Shah, and, and Harris Ralph um, were out of the team as well. So, you know, three of your main strike bowlers, it does handicap you to some degree, but I would have expected that playing at home, um, they would have had some backups that could have done the job. I guess, I'm not sure what the position is with Hasnain. I know he had some issues with his action, um, a young fast bowler who came on the scene about a year ago. Um, so really, you know, their best four fast bowlers, and those guys were a pass, those, those four, um, were not available to them. But I expected that the back, they would have had other backups as well. What were your thoughts, though, on how Jimmy Anderson, Robinson and Mark Wood bowled? Yeah, as a group, um, they bowled well. And that's what you want. You want a group to, you know, any team that just has one or two guys performing and the others not performing, um, you know, success doesn't come that easily. But I think the formula worked quite well for them. You've got Mark Wood out and out, um, raw pace. You know, Jimmy Anderson, you know, he's a wily old bowler, much slower than he was years ago, but still has good control and variations. Um, I think Robinson added uh, something to the to the, the attack, and um, yeah, so they, they had a good balanced attack um, who performed uh, maybe even better than they thought they would uh, in those circumstances because it's not easy to outbowl um, Pakistan in Pakistan, but they've, they've done it. Ollie Robinson now building up a, quite a good Test record. He's got sixty wickets at twenty. Yeah, so you know he's he's done very well. I mean, and we know he's had some difficulties with other things as well. But to, have, I guess, achieve what he's achieved in a, in a very short space of time, in the backdrop of things that have happened in his life, um, is commendable. So I think that 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 is an asset really for England right now. The England spinners, uh, Jack Leach, has now got over a hundred te- Test wickets. Did did he bowl a bit short at times though? Well, I mean, Jack Leach is that Leach. You know what you get with Jack Leach. He's going to be, he's going to be tight. Um, you wouldn't say he's a, you know, he's a match-winning spinner. Um, you know, he does the job. Um, and really, in Pakistan, he didn't have to be the match-winning spinner. He just really needed to keep things tight uh, because your seam bowlers were doing the job for you. So um, his role was not that critical as it as it would have been otherwise. So, uh, you know, I guess obviously he's made steady improvements over the last year. England have persevered with him. And, um, you know, I guess he's starting to repair that faith. He is more supported by Ben Stokes and, and Stokes does keep the field up a lot more when, when he's bowling. Yeah, I think perhaps Rook didn't have... Um, you know, enough patience with him. Um, he's, you know, he, I guess he wouldn't get him up the attack quite quickly, if he, particularly if he went um, for runs um, quickly. I mean, you may remember the Ashes series in Australia um, where the Australian's batsman got stuck into him very, very early. Uh, and that created a problem for Joe Root, um, who didn't perhaps back him to, to continue bowling, but pulled him up the attack quite quickly. 
Um, yeah, I mean, a new captain can have a, a different um, approach on a player because no two captains think alike. And obviously, you know, Drew Root is obviously, I mean, obviously, Ben Stokes is prepared to give him more opportunities um, to bowl, even if he's not bowling well. Um, but, you know, as I said, no two people are alike. Root can't not be like Stokes. Stokes can be like Root. They're two different people. I asked you on one of our recent podcasts because you'd been commentating around the country if England had any other spin bowlers. And we, we found one in the third test when Rian Ahmed got seven wickets and five wickets to, to win the match in Karachi. Yeah, I mean, they did well. And the timing of playing him was, was obviously right because just like the Pakistan spinner as well, um, the new boys actually surprised both teams because, you know, suddenly Pakistan's newest spin bowler was the main spinner. And, and Ahmed similarly came into the side as an unknown and then really became the frontline spinner. Not in terms of experience, but in the context of those three games. So I think there were two plus for England and Pakistan in that the newcomers particularly those leg spinners, surprise uh, both teams and, and had good success. I mean, in the end, the Pakistan spinner was more than 50, 60 overs, and he's a new boy. Had you seen Rian Ahmed bowl before? He'd only played three first-class games. No, I hadn't. Um, I'd never seen him bowl before, but obviously they, they have rated him quite highly, number one to have picked him in, in the squad, and and then obviously two to, to throw him into the freers so quickly as well. But it proved um, a success. But again, with him, um, you know, there's still much sterner test to come. And we'll see in the summer whether he's thrust into the cauldron of Ashes cricket or not. Yes, does he need to be handled carefully by England? Well, all young players need to be handled. Um, well, I mean, because someone shows a bit of talent it doesn't mean that they've, they've made it. All they've shown is that they've got the capability, if handled properly, um, to do the job. So yes, you have to handle him very carefully so that you get the benefits over the years. Um, there can be a, a desire to, to rush the youngster too much, believing that he's the finished product. Uh, and we've seen it too often around the world where People have come on the scenes as a very hot property and they've also disappeared just as quickly because of the way they have been handled. I think what England have done here after this series left them out of the next one, I think is, is good thinking. Yes, he's not, he's not going to New Zealand. And uh, one player who did play against New Zealand back in 1949 was Brian Close, who was the youngest player to play Test cricket for England. Now, did you play against Brian? Yes, I did. Um, I know. I know Brian. Uh, Brian was very much at Somerset when I was um, in my early days, and um, yeah, I mean, very tough as a fearless guy. Um, you know, who had fought many battles over the years, lost quite a few, <laughs> um, but. Um, no, I mean, obviously, that's a long, long time. And, and Ahmed has eclipsed that, which is, which is something special. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. Well, I've got a question for you now from uh, Bill Hearn, who you know, who wrote yes. Football's Black Pioneers with uh, co-author David Gleave. And he's asked, asked me, if you were captain in a side against England, how would you counter England's out-and-out aggressive strategy? I would want the Australian attack, for sure. <laughs> um, if I had the Australian attack, I, as a captain, I wouldn't have to do much. 
because those guys know what to do. Um, uh, it would just be a case of rotating them. Um, I think right now that is the that is the test. That's the acid test for um for England. That that relentless pace attack that Australia has right now. Um, so tell tell Bill that I as captain, all I would do is spin the toss and and leave it to Pat Cummins and the others. Well, thanks very much for the question, Bill. I've got another question now, actually, from David Fountain, who asks, what did you think of Ollie Pope's performances behind the stumps? And who is England's best wicketkeeper? I think, first of all, uh, I mean, Folks is the best wicketkeeper. There's no question about that. Um, I could understand Port keeping wicket because you had to balance the side. You cannot, you know, if, if you were to bring Folks in, uh, then who would you leave out of the side? So, you know, it made sense in this one-off situation. Um, when I say one-off, I mean one-off tour situation that, um, you know, someone like Port did the job because what it did was, you know, it, it lengthened the batting. Not that I'm saying that Folks is a, a bad batter because he's not. He's proven that he's a very capable batter. But, it, it, you know, it lengthened the batting. Um, I don't believe that that is a strategy that England would use forever in a day. Um, I think it, it was appropriate for this particular series and it worked out for them. Yeah, Ollie Pope did still score 238 runs in the series. Um, is he now settled as the England number three? Well, again, I mean, you know, good signs. Uh, so he batted quite well in the first test against South Africa that summer. Lowers on a difficult pitch. When I say difficult, it was difficult in terms of the attack. So that could go really well um, in that test match. You know, he was able to weather that. So the signs, the signs were good. Um, the other thing is, uh, when Johnny Bairstow comes back, what do you do with him? I mean, do you give him the gloves? Do you give him what? What? What happens? That is a, it's a nice position to be in, where you've got to make a decision whether. You know, you give based on the gloves or you give continue with Pope. Um, I think long term, they love to have a, a much more competent keeper because for sure against the Australians, you're going to be in the field a lot longer than, than against a lot of other sides. So you're going to need, you know, a, keep, a real keep, a keeper who's going to be able to keep for those long periods. But They've got time. They've got several months to, to work it out um, before the summer comes around. Yes, England off to New Zealand shortly. The first test out there at Mount Monganui on the 16th of February, second test at Wellington on the 24th of February. What do you think our chances in that two-test series are? Well, I expect that um, there will be very, very tough um, games. Uh, I believe that the fact that McCallum going back to New Zealand, that the New Zealanders will raise their game um, because they will not want to be beaten by um, one of their own, so to speak. So I expect, you know, it's going to be tough. For New Zealand, really, the key is going to be whether they can get their attack firing. I'm not sure whether um, what's happening with Trent Bolt. I mean, is he in the squad? Is he, uh, is he available to play? I'm not sure what the position is, but they're going to need to get their attack um, up to scratch because what we do know is obviously in New Zealand that pitches are generally good for batting. Um, even though the pitches look green, you know, they perform. You know, I remember saw a green pitch last year and um, Ken Williams just still got 250 on it. So they will know that um, batting and with England's new approach, they're going to have to be at the top of their game with the ball. So it is if they can get their attack um, fit and firing. And if they can, then I think you've got a good series on. But obviously England will be extremely confident going into that series. Yeah, England have brought Stuart Broad, Matthew Potts back and, and Mark Woods being rested. And also Dan Lawrence is back in the in the squad. Yeah, yeah and obviously rotation of... You know, it's nice to have players in the wings that you can rotate. And um, you know, Joe for Archer coming back now to start playing is 
we'll certainly be keeping an eye on him for the certainly as far as the summer is concerned. Yes, uh, Joffre Archer back for the uh, one day series against South Africa, which begins at the end of January. Uh, we've mentioned it quite a lot already. The Ashes, which starts on Friday, the 16th of June at Edgbaston. And I've got a question, and we probably covered this anyway, but I'm going to get it in anyway. It's from an Aussie who I know, Nathan Gage. Um, he played minor counties cricket for Wales, and he's now the groundsman at Kidderminster Harriers Football Club. And he's asked me, can Basball work against a decent bowling attack? You can tell he's an Aussie. Well, listen, it's... I mean, they say basketball. I, I would say a more aggressive approach, um, a fearless approach. Of course, a fearless approach can work against um, top team, but you know you're going to have to be very much more calculated in terms of how and when you use it. I don't think it can be all out attack. I mean, if you if you just go all out attack um, against the Australians, uh, you know you're going to play into their hands because you're not playing against rookies. You know, you've got a settled bowling unit of four or five bowlers that's been settled for many years. So that in itself is enough to tell you that you've got to be, you've got to take calculated risk. It cannot just be all out uh, risk. Otherwise, you, you will feel the, the, the consequences. So tell him really, you know, they're going to be, they're going to try to impose themselves against the Australians. Uh, but you know, they will meet with stern resistance. And it's going to be a real cat and mouse to see whether England will, one, continue to adopt um, that bowl approach, um, and two, whether if they do, Australia, how Australia respond, uh, whether they can stop it. So it, it, it argues for a good contest. I think the spectators, uh, spectators will be the beneficiaries next year to, to see these two approaches. At the end of it, then you will know for sure uh, which one is the better approach. And have you got a serious prediction for, for the Ashes? It's a long way off yet, but uh, I know you're good at football predictions, but not so good <laughs> on cricket. Well, there are so many variables um, in this particular series. Um, you've got an England side on the up. But I still untested against the better teams. Uh, you, you've got an Australian team that's getting back to something near their best, um, being quite ruthless at the moment. I see it being an extremely tough series. Would not be at all surprised if it finished 2 2. There's going to be a draw then, is it? When ben Stokes doesn't do draws. Well, I mean, he may have to this year. Um, but, yeah, I, I figure he could finish 2-2. Two, two. OK, there's lots of things to happen uh, before then. We've got, say, New Zealand two tests and a test against Ireland, which starts on the 1st of June. Also, uh, congratulations on your new job as a West Indies selector. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, much appreciated. Um, yes, a uh, job that I'm really looking forward to. and. Um, you know, we've got a couple of tours coming up soon, Zimbabwe and South Africa. Um, so, yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, exciting times. All formats? Yeah, that's all formats. Um, senior, men's senior and um, the under-19s uh, and 18, etc. And the West Indies have just returned from a tour of Australia when they lost by 164 runs and then 419 runs in the the second test. Worse than expected? Um, well, I mean, nobody ever expects to, to lose by those margins. But, you know, you've also got to be fairly realistic in terms of, you know, where you're at at the moment and where the opposition are at, at the moment. Um, so if you take the West Indian team that played in Australia and put it against side and side with the Australian side, um, you can see that there's going to be a huge difference. There's a huge difference in terms of experience. There's a, there's a huge difference in terms of games played by the individual players. Um, there's a huge difference in terms of runs scored by the batsmen, wickets taken by the bowlers. 
Um, so you can see the, the differences in the, in the two outfits, and you add to that an Australian team playing at home um, who would have been snarling from not winning or getting close to winning the World Cup uh, in, on their home soil. Um, obviously, the task was going to be very difficult for the West Indies, and so it proved. Um, so, you know, we know we've got a lot of work to do. Um, there's no question about that. Um, there is a, a bit of a, a gulf at the moment between England, Australia, and India, and perhaps the rest of the group. So we have to work hard to, to, to close that gap. And, you know, I am confident, you know, that in time that that will happen. But it's, you know, it's not going to be easy. Well, let's hope so. I think the, the cricket in fans around the world would love to see the West Indies back at their best. Well, we all do. Um, as you know, West Indian fans are very passionate about um, West Indies cricket. You know, they have seen over the years, they've seen... There are many people alive who've seen the glory days and long for those days to come back. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a work in, project, in progress. You know, we've got a lot of hard work to do right around the, uh, the, the whole region. And, you know, that's what we're doing. We're going to work to ensure that, you know, West Indies can become um, a very, very competitive unit in work cricket. Well, the very best of luck with that. Uh, I just wanted to end with a couple of questions, really. was with what was your cricketing highlight of 2022? Well, clearly, I think England's demolition of India, um, that 10-wicket win, uh, would be a highlight because I don't think it was expected by most cricket fans uh, to see that sort of domination. So, you know, obviously that, that is something special. And your England Player of the Year? I would say Johnny Bairstow, really. Um, the rich form that he exhibited, particularly last summer, um, again unexpected by the position that when the summer started, when he was in the team, um, to finish the, the season, he probably scored five or six centuries in quick in quick succession. Um, really, that 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 was something special for him and, and for the team. And returning to England's. 3 0 win in Pakistan. How remarkable will we look back on that in years to come? Well, I think they can build on that result um, in future overseas tours to Pakistan. Then, obviously, it would have been a significant breakthrough. Not at all easy to, first of all, win in Pakistan, but to win by such a margin. Um, they must feel very proud of that. Um, obviously, since then, Pakistan have had various changes. <laughs> um, new board, new chairman, etc. So was that a reaction to the, the series or was that for other reasons? But as we know, things tend to a little bit different in Pakistan. But getting back to your question, I think obviously England would hope that they've turned a corner in terms of playing and getting results on the subcontinent by that result they'll be quite they certainly have that in their mind that maybe that was a, a pivotal point um, in, in in their development well thank you once again for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion we'll look out for your cricket predictions uh, i probably should be asking you now while we're on the subject of a sport you know well in football who's going to win the um, fa premier league that's not really a question Stephen. Um, I, I, I would say again, like against the odds, unexpected. Um, I think Arsenal will. I, I think they'll do a Leicester City. I believe that everybody is waiting and saying uh, they're gonna they're gonna fall. They started well, and people were saying, "Well, by Christmas we'll see. By January, transfer window we'll see. By February we'll see." Uh, just like they did with Leicester, they kept believing that they would be they were falter. And they never did. So I believe Arsenal will win this year. Unexpectedly, but yes. Oh, I'm pleased you said that. We probably have to keep throwing in, throwing the odd football prediction in so you get it right. But we will hold <laughs> you now to your uh, Ashes 2-2. But that still means that um, 
you know, people like Nathan will be really happy, but uh, myself and Bill won't be. <laughs> well, I mean, you should be happy with the draw. If you can hold the Aussies to a 2 2 draw, then that's something to be to be proud of. To win well, we, two games to win two games against them will be a good effort. Well, we won two games against them in 2019, and the Aussies haven't won here since 2001. So we can keep our fingers crossed. You can, uh, but I think right now the Aussies have a much more settled um, batting lineup. They, they, they know they they know they're one to six, which is important. They're not tinkering with with anyone. They know this is the one to six, and that that is very very important, especially when you've got um, five top class bowlers as well. And, and I think Cameron Green is. Um, just fill that all around this position perfectly for them as well. Well, thanks once again, and I'll speak to you after the um, series in New Zealand. Yes, even no problem. And, um, you know, we're all looking forward to, to some good cricket in the new year. And the um, new year has started well, and let's, let's get the cricket going. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Why? Why? If you have T-Mobile 5G home internet, you might be hearing this a lot. Why? Every time your internet slows down during the busiest hours. Why? Why? Because your network gives priority to cell phone users. Why? Why? Good question. Why not switch to Cox Internet with two times faster download speeds than T-Mobile 5G home internet during peak hours? Okay. Stop the whys and visit cox.com slash 5G home for details. T-Mobile prioritizes certain T-Mobile phone users over home internet users during times of congestion. 